with that, again, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. And we're going to kick things off. So we're starting with the ACM series amplifiers today. We're going to talk about uh, all the different ACM amps. Um, like Chris said, some of the cool features and benefits of them. Um, you know, some of the neat things that you can do with them. Some of the cool stuff that you may or may not have known about them. So all sorts of goodies there. And before we get into uh, that, one of the things that I like to ask you guys is, um, you know, what you want to see in these uh, trainings. So I'm throwing up a poll right now for you. If you want to click on there for me and just tell me, you know, what you'd like to see in a future training. I ask this a lot and you guys are probably getting sick of me asking every week, but we do want to find out, you know, what's important to you, what you guys want to see in these trainings. And it's important that we do something that's valuable for you guys. So you should see a, a poll popping up on your screen. Please take a couple seconds there and vote for me. And that way we can do stuff that's valuable to you guys. Um, I've tried to kind of narrow things down too in the past. Sometimes there's 10 different options on there of what you can choose from. I just kind of narrowed things down here a little bit and, uh, you know, want to see what you guys are interested in. So I'll give you guys a chance to vote on there and wait till we get at least half of you voted on there before we move on. So I appreciate you guys participating in those for us. Like I said earlier, uh, Chris is here with me, uh, Chris Bennett. He'll be kind of monitoring the uh, Facebook comments and the Zoom chat. If you are joining us on Facebook uh, via Facebook Live, um, if you want to, for the best experience, switch over to Zoom. The link is there in the post and uh, Zoom will have better video quality, better audio quality, as well as the ability to um, vote in our polls and just have a little bit more interactive experience if you want. So if you're watching this on Facebook and you wanna switch over to Zoom, now's a great time to do that before we really get into things. And uh, we're at about 60% voted there. So I will uh, shut down the polls here and have a look at the results. So uh, about 50-50, most of you wanna see product trainings and a lot of you want to see a tour of audio controls facilities and uh, just kind of do a walkthrough of the building. So that'll definitely be something I would like to do in the future just because I think we have a, a pretty cool thing going here and uh, there's a lot more to it than maybe you know. So um, I will certainly keep that one uh, in mind for future training. So thanks for voting guys. So let's get into the ACM amplifier family. So I'm going to start out with the uh, individual models. So um, some of this for some of you guys will be familiar. Some of you guys are familiar with the stumps, some of you aren't. Um, but we'll start with the ACM 4.300. So this is our ACM 4.300, physically a very small amplifier. All of these amplifiers, you guys, are, are everything in the ACM family is really a compact, small amplifier. And we didn't just come up with ACM amplifiers because we wanted to make small amps because everybody else is making small amps. We came up with ACM amplifiers because we wanted to make small amplifiers that actually sound good and have some really cool integrated features. And we'll get more into that stuff as we go along here. So you can see in my hand, I've got an ACM 4.300, uh, 300 watts RMS. As with all of the audio control lineup, if you see in the model number, uh, when you look at the model number, I should say, it's really easy to know what it is that you've got. So an ACM 4.300 is exactly that. It's an ACM series amplifier. It is four channels and it is 300 watts RMS. So whenever you see one of our products and you see the layout there, that's what that means. The first one there, the single digit is gonna be how many channels. The final number is the wattage and our wattage ratings are all RMS. We don't do a peak power. We don't do a max power or anything like that. So when you see an ACM 4.300, you know, most other manufacturers would probably call this a 4.900 or at least a 4.600. Um, we're just going to be honest and straightforward and tell you, hey, it'll at least do 300 watts RMS all day long. Um, so when you look at those power ratings, 4.300, you can see on your screen there, that is 75 watts by four. That's going to get you your 300 watt power rating or bridged for 150 by two. So really solid power out of a small amplifier. Um, something that is a common theme throughout all of the ACM series amplifiers. Um, I'm showing you this amplifier without its top cover plate on right now. And we'll get into some more of the top cover plate stuff in a little bit. But I'm going to just show you, this is a cover plate for a 2.300, but same size. So the top cover plates, when they ship to you, will look something like this. They're mounted onto the top of the amplifier with four little screws. But the reason I don't have the 4.300 plate on here right now is because I've actually mounted it to the back. 
the back of these amplifiers have the same four mounting holes uh, pattern on the back as they do on the front. So if you need to flush mount these behind a trim panel or do something custom with them, do something cool, you can easily cut out a rectangle, drop this thing in, a couple of screws in there, and you've got a custom looking install, or cut out a hole, backload this, and run a couple of self-tappers in there, and now it looks like it's a, a full custom build or something like that. So one of those small things that's you know not a huge deal, but kind of something unique that makes them a little bit different from what everybody else does. Um, the other cool thing is once that top cover plate is on these, you guys, everything's covered up as far as gain controls, um, uh, crossover, the lighting on it, everything is completely covered. So they're very kind of incognito and, and kind of stealth once they're hidden under a seat or what have you. So um, we're just going to go through kind of the, the basic models first and their power ratings, and then we'll dig deeper into the individual features and things like that here in just a second. So starting with the 4.300 you see on your screen right now, this is our four channel version. All of these amplifiers we're about to talk about are the same physical size, just so that you know. Um, to give you an idea of the physical size, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, this is an iPhone XS Max, which is not a huge phone, but this is an iPhone compared to an ACM amplifier. So as you can see, physically, not a whole lot bigger than an iPhone, maybe an extra, I don't know, two and a half, three inches, something like that. So for those of you that aren't familiar with these or haven't ever put one in, held one, played with one, whatever, um, they are physically very small. Moving on to the uh, 2.300, as you can see, same size there. Power ratings wise though, uh, again, 300 watts just divided up differently. So we've either got you know, 300 watts divided by four channels, like you just saw a second ago, or you've got 400 watts divided by two channels, or we have the 1.300, which is four, or excuse me, 300 watts divided by one channel, obviously, right? So when you're looking at these amplifiers, one of the cool things that makes them a little bit unique, especially with say the 1.300, is when we're looking at the 1.300, again, it's size, right? So I showed you guys it next to a um, iPhone, now I'm showing it to you next to a LC2i. So when you look at a 1.300 and you look at the LC2i, you can see physically not that much bigger. If I put it in front of it especially, it is almost the exact same height width as an LC2i, just a few inches longer. One of the reasons I always do that when I show these amplifiers too, especially the 1.300, is that the 1.300 actually has an LC2i built in. So pretty much all of the ACM amplifiers have some sort of you know, LC type technology built into it. I'm not gonna say that they have a you know, LC7i built into a, a four channel amp or anything like that, but it has our LC series input technology built in. And what I mean by that is all of the ACM series amplifiers will accept 40 volts of high level input, okay? So just like an LC2i will take in 40 volts of high level in speaker level input, the ACM amplifiers will do the same. So if you need to just do a quick base package or you need to add on to a system and, and add a quick sub, the ACM 1.300 is an awesome way to go. Um, for those of you that have never tried one of these, they really do pack a punch and we're pretty conservative with our power ratings on these. So you can rest assured you're gonna get at least that 300 watts out of it. So when I say this has an LC2i built in, I don't just mean that this will take in 40 volts of high level input, because it will, um, but it also does have AccuBase built in. So just like you'll see on your screen there in front of you, AccuBase is built into this guy just like an LC2i. So there's really no need to put in a, say three or 400 watt basic inexpensive subamp plus an LC2i, when you could just do say an ACM 1.300, and you've got everything you need in one little tiny package like this. For the shops out there that have used these before, um, you know, if you, if you have a buddy that works at another shop that has put these in, ask them what they thought of it. Everybody's always blown away the first time that they put one of these in, the first time that they try one out, just by how much power, how much performance they get out of something so small. Um, it's not uncommon at all for us to hear, Chris and I both have heard this, where guys take out a amplifier from a competing brand, or a, a, just a different brand, and it's physically larger, it had a higher power rating on it, you know, maybe it was a, a 500 watt mono, uh, model or something like that, and it failed or it was too big or old or whatever the case was, and the shop takes it out and they put in the ACM 1.300, and we get these calls and texts that go, 
dude, I was blown away. I was not expecting that much power to come out of something so small. So one of those things where until you try it, you won't really know, um, but pretty, pretty spectacular as far as what you get from something this small. Yeah, as far as AccuBase goes, so just, just so everybody understands and knows, um, you know, AccuBase is, is, a, is something that's going to be on all of our um, mono amplifiers. So it doesn't matter if it's the ACM-1300, the upcoming ACXs, uh, the LC-1800, the LC-1500, mm -hmm. and even on the upcoming... Um, you know, uh, five channel amplifiers, AccuBase will always be on the sub outputs for you guys. So um, the other cool thing is like what he was talking about and, the, and, and having that 40 volts of input, you know, we will always make sure that you guys have access to high level and low level inputs that can handle up to 40 volts. It's kind of like the staple for audio control. We're not gonna yeah. come out with a, a brand new DSP or amplifier or anything else like that and then you know, say, hey, you know, maximum input is now 20 volts, <laughs> you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll continue um, keeping AccuBase on all the sub outputs. Um, the five channels coming up are really simplified. And as we go through, you know, the ACMs, you know, the ACM lineup with the three amplifiers that we're going over today, you know, our, our game plan was always to have maybe upwards of seven amplifiers in that lineup that maybe we do a, a five channel, maybe we do you know, a six channel or, or whatever in this lineup as well. So if you guys haven't tried these amplifiers, um, powerful AccuBase up to 40 volts of input. And just like Matthew showed you, you know, the size wise, you can't get any better in this size footprint that, that I'm aware of as far as the sound quality goes. Yeah. And so, you know, speaking of models and things like that, I was talking about the 4.300 a minute ago. I just put it back up on your screen. Um, the 4.300, because it is bridgeable too, would make a great like beginner amplifier for a guy with maybe a smaller car, you know, maybe he's on a budget, something like that, and just wants to, um, you know, start out by amplifying maybe his front door speakers and a small sub, maybe a single eight or single 10 inch woofer in a prefab box. Maybe he's got a small hatch, uh, hatchback car or something like that. 4.300 would be a great kind of beginner amplifier for, for that purpose. And, you know, one of the cool things that we wanted to do with the ACM line, and one of the things that I think we did really, really well, is the ability to make these kind of modular. And what I mean by that is the ability to start out with maybe a 4.300 amplifier and say, okay, oh, sorry, uh, you know, the customer wants to amplify those front door speakers and run a small sub, something like that. And so you get them into a 4.300 to begin, and they're, they're happy with it. It sounds better. They've got more volume, more clarity. They've got a little bit of bass now. But if you're smart when you're selling and installing this stuff, you're also kind of future-proofing them and setting them up for things in the future. And what I mean by that is when they come back and they go, you know, this sounds good, but I just, I want a little bit more bass. I was hoping for more output. Okay, great. So now we can take a 1.300, we can add this onto the system, and obviously physically they're the same size, so they're gonna look nice mounted next to each other. You can mount them back to back like this, you know, do something like that, and you've got a pretty compact little setup there, but now you've got 300 watts dedicated to their woofer, you've got 300 watts to run all four speakers, or maybe an active front speaker setup, something like that, and you've got plenty of power. And when they come back in, you know, whatever it is, a, a couple more weeks or another month or so, and they go, you know, I really want to step this up one more time and I do want to go full active and I want to do three-way components now or something like that. Well, now you put them into a 2.300 in there and now you've got a four channel 300 watt, uh, excuse me, four channel 300 watt model. You've got a two channel 300 watt and a mono 300 watt. You could easily use all three amplifiers in one car and have, you know, a fully active three-way front stage or active uh, fronts with a set of coaxes in the rear, all amplified, plus sub, something like that. And that kind of brings us to some of the cool things that we can do with these. And I'll click through here and show you um, one of the, the cool ways that we can kind of use these together. While and you're is, doing that, um, yeah. a, couple, a couple of questions. Uh, yes, all the ACMs will accept up to four gauge uh, on the inputs. Yep. Um, you know, so it's 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 really tight on four gauge, but four gauge will certainly work on there. Yep. Um, the only other thing that uh, that is notable that to me is something that I'll bring up is the remote turn on 
Um, you know, if you are using 16, 18 gauge wire, you will certainly need to uh, bend over and tin those because the, the set screw on there can be a little bit, uh, you know, a lot of manufacturers don't like talking about all the ins and outs, but yeah. I think, you know, uh, that amplifier, that block on the remote turn on, just make sure that that's really secure because it is a larger opening yeah. for 16, 18 gauge wire. That remote turn on would probably take eight gauge in <laughs> if you mm -hmm. want to run eight gauge remote turn on. Right. So what I used to do with a lot of those is if you have ferrules, ferrules look fantastic. That would be a great way to make this look tidy and it'll fit nice and all that good stuff. If you don't have ferrules, if you're running wire straight into the input terminals of these, that's fine too. Maybe crimp a male bullet on the end of that remote turn on. That used to be a way I did it sometimes too, just to give it something to tighten down on and crunch down on a little bit. And it's, you know, otherwise if you are running 16, 18 gauge remote turn on, like Chris said, maybe strip it back instead of a quarter inch, strip it back an inch, fold it over itself and tin it. So there's a little bit of bulk there for that set screw to tighten down on. Um, and somebody brought up the idea of do these take four gauge? They sure do. Um, do they necessarily need four gauge? Probably not. I mean, they have 30 amp fusing in them. So chances are you're not going to need four gauge ran to them. You're probably going to get away with eight gauge or even 10 gauge if it's a real short run. But I would advise always running four gauge to these every time. Even if you're only going to put in one, run four gauge to it. And here's why. If the customer does come back in three weeks, six weeks, six months, a year, whatever, and wants to upgrade, wouldn't it be nice if you already had a heavy gauge power ran there? You could toss in a distribution block real quick and you know add on that sub amp or add on that two channel, whatever it is, and you don't have to run a whole separate eight gauge or 10 gauge because you've already ran heavy gauge there. It makes a whole lot more sense to me to just do it once than to do multiple runs. So that would be one of the things that I would certainly advise. Um, with these two, we talked about the idea of you know putting in a four channel and then adding on a mono. So what we did with these is, let's say you start with your uh, 4.300 or your 1.300, your customer comes back, wants to add one or the other. If you stack them back to back like this, we have a piece called the ACM 5.600. It is a cover plate. It goes like so, and it screws onto all of the factory mounting points of the amplifiers and holds them together as one. So you will have connections coming out of both sides of this, yes but you've now created a five channel 600 watt amplifier that's in a nice compact footprint. One of the other cool things you can do with that is it is stackable, okay? If you get these in this size with our DM608 DSP. So again, we talked about being modular, right? So your customer has come in, they put in a sub amp to begin, they did the 1.300, right? So we'll start with that. They came in, they put in the 1.300, we just did a base upgrade. We left all the speakers stock, we left the radio factory, we just added a single 10 and a 300 watt amp. You know, that's good enough for some guys, great. Well, when they come back and they do wanna upgrade the door speakers and add a four channel amplifier and all that, okay, perfect. So now we add our 4.300, right? We've got our 1.300, we put those two together, okay? and we stack our 5.600 mounting plate on there. Well, cool, now I've got a five channel 600 watt amplifier that I was able to do modularly. Are there other five channel micro amplifiers out there? Absolutely. Are there other four channel and mono micros? Totally, but can you do it modularly? I think that's a, that's a key to this whole thing because with my experience, a lot of times customers come in and they want the world, they want a super high output, big budget, big wattage system. But a lot of times their budget doesn't allow that, right? They, they can only afford to do a base upgrade right now, or they wanna do it in stages or that sort of thing. So that's where these, this really comes in is, is you can give them the ability to add on and not have it look tacky or look added on. You know, these look like it was intentional, right? So now we've got a five channel, it sounds good, but we're still using internal crossovers. Um, you know, we don't really have any EQ other than what's built into that factory radio, that sort of thing. So if they do want to take it up a, a notch and, and take it to the next level, now you get them into the DM608. Now we've got a six channel input, eight channel output, um, full DSP. And it happens to be, let me set these down so that I can stack this up properly. It's kind of hard to juggle all these. But if you can see that, this all fits into one footprint. These are the same size once they are stacked up. So you could actually fit potentially under a seat or something like that. 
you could fit a DM608 plus a four channel plus a mono all in one space. And you can stack those all on top of each other as you go. So it's a pretty cool way to do it. I mean, it allows you to, like I said, do it in steps, do it in stages, give your customer that opportunity to, to build on it. And if you really wanted to, I mean, you could even come up with a package in your store that's like stage one is a base upgrade, stage two is you know, mids, highs, and a four channel. Stage three is adding the DM608. Stage four is adding a 2.300 and going to, you know, active components in the front or something like that. It would be really, really easy using these products to put together a single sheet that you could have, you know, that has stage one through five, and maybe it's geared towards a specific vehicle. Hey, you've got a Dodge Ram, we have stage one through five for Dodge Rams right here, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of cool things you could do with these that would help to kind of build on that whole thing, right? So that's one of those things that I always kind of bring up when I'm talking about these amplifiers. One of the other things that I always like to talk about too is some of the other cool features built into these. We talked about the ability to handle 40 volts of high level input. We talked about that the mono has AccuBase. Um, one of the other cool things on these amplifiers, even on the mono version, is that this is a full range amplifier. So if you did want to use this in an interesting application where you wanted to run one of these as a left amplifier and one of these as a right amplifier, you could do that, okay? They're full range, they're not limited. Um, they're not limited to only sub frequencies or anything like that. They do have a crossover built in, of course. So these are a um, defeatable crossover. It'll do 80 hertz low pass, 120 hertz low pass, or off or bypass, however you want to call that. So it'll just be full range or pass through. Um, so it works well there. And then this does have our GTO technology built in as well. Um, GTO stands for great turn on. This is our DC offset auto turn on feature. And one of the cool things on audio control products, some of you may know this, some of you might not, is that when you're using GTO on an ACM amplifier or any audio control product for that, uh, for that matter, when you're turning it on via signal sense or via GTO DC offset, the remote uh, terminal on this actually becomes an output to turn on another amplifier or to turn on another device. So if you use signal sense in this, you don't have to feed remote turn on into the amplifier, but you can use a small lead from this to another amp to turn it on if you needed to. So just a little piece of uh, info for you there in case you didn't know. Yep, couple couple questions that came up. Um, I mentioned something about five channels. So five channel with PSP, um, that is going to probably be at the end of third quarter right now. Um, still some more work to be done there. And of course, we're all trying to work hard to get that stuff going. And that will be a full size five channel with DSP, yes. just FYI. That not, is not, not an ACM. ACM. That's a full size no. like LC or D series chassis um, for those of you looking forward to that. We're looking forward to those as well, but with everything going on right now, you know, some of these projects have had to be pushed back a little bit. And then um, how can a friend get some POP? We have some POP. Just um, if you can reach out to your rep and see if you can get my email address or something like that. Um, yep. If you have, a, if you're a local retailer, you can reach out to your rep and you can uh, work with them to get some stuff going for the store. Sure. Um, something like that. Uh, I wanted to talk about that modular approach with the ACMs. You know that the ACMs were never meant to be, you know, that big, huge, you know, 3,000 watt system. They were really engineered to be, you know, all about sound quality. Yep. Um, and Interestingly enough, you know, like I had mentioned, we wanted to do up to words of seven amplifiers in that lineup. So and I'm actually going to launch a poll right now mm -hmm. to ask you guys about some of the things you'd like to see in the future while Chris is talking about this. So yeah, the modular approach. So I don't know how many of you guys are old school car stereo installers or anything like that, but if you know, um, you know, when five channels first came out 20 years ago, a single power supply. Class D was not nearly as clean as it was today. Yep. And, um, you know, every five channel I ever installed, the customer always wanted more bass. Yep. And so, um, you know, they go and turn the gain up on the bass output all the way. And the actual, you know, highs portion of the amplifier suffer dramatically and go into a distortion or clipping kind of situation where the voltage rail sag on the front end. Um, and, and this modular approach overcomes all that. Each amplifier has its own power supply, so dedicated sub amplifier versus high amplifier. And as an old retailer, I always wanted to have the ability to upgrade customers. You know, um, 
I, I believe in the mentality that when, when, as a retailer, when somebody comes to me for a stereo system, I want them as my customer for life, you know? And so this modular approach to amplification makes so much sense because um, you can always, you know, turn the car over and say, okay, you know, you've got your sub package. If you ever want to add more power to your front speakers, come see us. Or here's your five channel amplifier. If you ever want to double your power to the front speakers or add another subwoofer or anything like that, you can certainly do that. Here's your keys. And then, you know, maybe five or six months down the road, that customer maybe has a little bit of money in their pocket and they're like, you know, I could use a little more power and they're going to come back and see you. And now you have the means instead of having to swap a five channel for a bigger five channel or then go into a four channel in mono. And, you know, so the modular approach makes a lot of sense for system design long term. Um, you know, so yeah, it's important to plant that seed for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and how many of you guys, you know, uh, have had the same car for more than three years, right? So, you know, over time we get accustomed to things. We want more, we like having, you know, something nicer to keep that car new or vibrant or whatever. And audio is one of the best ways to do that. So, um, I've been looking at new cars myself. <laughs> And I can't do it because my system is dialed in. You know what I mean? So it's like, I love it. And, you know, that kind of prevents me from going out and buying a new car. But uh, yeah, and that used to be something at the shop that we would do all the time is, you know, guys would come in and go, well, you know, my wife is looking for a new car. I convinced her to just put in a touch screen, put in a backup camera, upgrade the audio, and maybe do leather or remote start or something like that. And, and you know, get her to fall in love with the car all over again. And I know that works for me. I mean, I'll be kind of thinking about, eh, I'm ready to get rid of this thing, blah, blah, blah. And I'll wash it, I'll detail the inside, and I will like retune the audio or add some new component or do some new sound deadening or add something to the audio system. And all over again, I'm like, nope, can't get rid of it. Love this car. You know, you want to you wanna fall in love with the car all over again. And, and that's what we should be getting our customers to do too is, you know, it's, it doesn't need to be about getting a new car and having that new $1,000 a month car payment. It should be about coming in and just upgrading what they have and, and, and you know, falling in love with it all over again. And audio is a great way to do that. And these amplifiers are a great key to kind of unlocking that upgrade potential, especially when, like Chris said, you, you plant that little seed as they're paying or you're handing them their keys. Hey, you know, it sounds great. We're happy with what we did today. I hope you're happy with it. But if you ever want to step things up in the future, come see us. We've got an amp that's the same size, looks just like it. It'll fit right into your system, and we could really kind of take this thing to the next level. They're always going to be wondering in the back of their mind, well, what's that next level like? You know, how, how much better would it sound if I went to that next level? Well, have them come find out. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a great way to do that. So. Yeah. Carlos did ask, um, do we need to consider the signal to noise ratio of the speaker when pairing those amplifiers? As Matthew mentioned, those four channel amps in addition to the uh, in addition to the RMS power of the speakers too. I think absolutely in any system design that you're doing, you want to pay attention to the efficiency of the speakers for the amplification that you're doing. Um, as far as putting it together for RMS power to the speakers, um, you know, with this series of amplifiers, yeah, you, you certainly want to make sure you have some really nice, efficient speakers, you know, so, um, you know, I think when you look at the audio control lineup with the amplifiers and the ACM and long-term plans and all that stuff, as a retailer, you know, I would say that these amplifiers are going to do just fine with a good quality, efficient uh, component set up into the $300 range, yeah. you know, three, $300, $350 range for a set of components. ACM amplifiers are going to be fine. Most, most of what you're buying in that quality you have to remember too, we're not a speaker manufacturer at this point. And so you, you have to know what you're getting in speakers because obviously, you know, just like amplification, you have the same thing with speakers. You have, you know, speaker manufacturers that say 2000 watts, you know, with a thousand watt RMS, but yeah. that's just not reality, you know? So um, I think just pairing the same matching quality of a good efficient speaker set with the ACMs, you can't get any better yeah. and i think in quality brands of speakers i think that kind of 299 price point is perfect for the acms yeah, as agree. a retailer if i was you know somebody came in and they're looking at 
you know, an $850 pair of three ways or something like that. I would certainly be looking at either the D series amplifiers yeah. um, with DSP or, you know, the LC amplifiers, yeah. you know, um, as a retailer, I would, I personally would never uh, want to sell a pair of $400 or up speakers without a DSP. Right. I agree. Know? Yeah. And I think, I think price point wise, I think Chris makes a good point, you know, component set that's going to be right around that that price point of right around maybe two to three hundred dollars um generally speaking power wise is going to be very compatible with these um and then you know with that too i'm always kind of of the mindset where i like to overpower things a little bit that way everything stays clean you know i pay attention to rms ratings but you know if, if we're talking about say a, a whatever a 2.300 and you've got 75 watts rms to work with at 4 ohm and maybe the components you're looking at are rated at 60 watts RMS, you're going to be fine, okay? You, you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm 15 watts overpowered, so on and so forth. You're better to overpower than you are to underpower, right? I mean, overpowering is not going to blow up that speaker. In fact, you're going to have more headroom. The amp's not going to be working as hard, and you're going to end up with less distortion, and, and you know, it's, it's all going to be good. So I don't think you're going to have any problems there. I think efficiency would be the thing that I would pay, you know, close attention to if it were me, um, just making sure that I've got a speaker that's gonna be able to take the usable power and do something with it. Um, and, and generally speaking, the price points we're talking about, those speakers are usually gonna be a pretty efficient speaker for the most part too. Speaking of price points, um, we'll talk about price on these guys as well, because that's always a, a question that comes up with the ACMs. So with the ACM amplifiers, these are usually offered right around the $300 price point in most stores. Um, so, you know, $279 usually for the uh, 1.300 ACM, and then usually about $299 to $329 for the uh, four channel or two channel version. So just depending on, of course, where you're buying it from and that sort of thing. Aubrey asked about uh, sub control for the ACM That's five. So. Great point. Yep. So with the ACM, um, say we're doing the uh, 5.600 and you're doing a 1.300 and a 4.300 in there. I think that's what she was asking about. The ACM 1.300 does have our ACR port on it. Um, so we use the ACR1, which is this little guy right here. This has a kind of telephone port style connector on there that will plug into an ACM 1.300. The, uh, the thing to kind of look at with ACM 1.300s as well is there was a very, very first generation 1.300 that did not have the port on it for the ACR1. So if you or a customer or somebody says, hey, I found this incredible deal on an ACM 1.300, pay attention to that and look at if it has that ACR1 port on it. The one that I have in my hand here actually does not have that port on it. So when you look at it here over on this side, this is a pretty old sample. Um, this does not have the ACR1 port. It would be right in this area. So this one that's here on the desk does have that port on it. Anything that you're going to get from us, you know, or, or anything that's recent is going to have that port. How long ago was it, Chris, that they didn't have the port on? Uh, two years ago. Two years ago. So it would be, you know, somebody's maybe got new old stock or it's a clearance deal or something like that. So it's just one of those things to pay attention to. You know, if you're, if you are a consumer and you're thinking about shopping for one of these and you go, oh, I found this amazing deal on this thing. It's way cheaper than everybody else. There's a good chance that it may be that first generation product without the port. And you may or may not care about that. Maybe that's not a big deal for you. Maybe you're going to control sub volume via a DSP or something like that, because of course you could do that through a DSP. But if it is going to be a standalone amplifier and you do care about having that ACR1 dash control knob, you're going to want to make sure that your uh, ACM 1.300 has that port on there. Um, another thing that I always kind of uh, just bring up with the ACM amplifiers, when you're looking at any of the ACMs, um, one of the things to kind of keep in mind is we talked about the fact that these will accept 40 volts of high level input. Okay, so these will take in up to 40 volts. What does that really mean? It means that equates to about 400 watts of input. So it means that you can use these in pretty much any car on the road. So whether it's a higher end vehicle like a BMW, Mercedes, Range Rover, Porsche, whatever, something with a amplified premium sound system, you can take that factory amplified signal and send it straight into this amplifier and it's still gonna work. It's gonna be able to take that signal and deal with it. On the flip side of that though, if you are working with a car that's maybe a base model, maybe it is a car that just has 
you know, real simple factory stereo and four speakers, a, a common mistake sometimes that's, that's made with these is guys will take that, that signal, they tap into some rear deck speakers or some front door speakers that are in a base model vehicle. They feed that signal into the high level input of these ACM amplifiers, and then they start setting it up. They put in their woofer and all that. And they start setting up the gain and crossover controls, and they're not overly enthused about it. You know, they're not super impressed. They go, well, you know, it's, it's just okay. I don't really hear a lot of bass. I'm not getting a ton of output. You know, this thing seems weak. In that case, what we would always ask guys to do, and really what they should be doing beforehand anyway, is measuring that signal that you're tying into and finding out what type of voltage is that signal. Is this a real low voltage signal because it's a real weak powered factory radio? If that's the case, if you get into a signal that's maybe, I don't know, say under eight to 10 volts, um, and it's, it's just deck power like that, we may want to take that same signal and rather than feeding it into the high level input, feed it into the RCA input. And the reason why is the high level input on these ACM amplifiers, think about what it's doing. It's taking in that, that high level signal. And remember, this will take up to 40 volts. So it can accommodate a really high level signal. But because of that, when it takes in that signal, it has to pad that input and push, you know, pad down that signal a little bit to be usable with the input section. So if we take an already weak, low signal, feed it into this and it pads it down further, of course, we're not gonna get a lot of output. So if you put in one of these and you weren't super impressed with it, if you had the opportunity, I would say take that input, feed it into the RCA instead, and I'd be willing to bet 99% of the time you'll be far more impressed with it. And it's one of those things where you can just take an old set of RCAs you have laying around, you know, uh, take one end of the RCAs and cut them off, and you'll have twisted leads on either wire there that you can use as your input or there are companies that sell RCAs that just end in speaker wire for that exact purpose. So that's just a little tip if you've ever tried one of these or wanna try one, maybe you tried one and weren't super impressed or something like that and you didn't find that tip out. Um, Chris and I talk about that quite a bit, but it's one of those things that maybe you know gets missed sometimes. Yeah, the only other thing like, you know, when we look at the size of the ACMs, the size was probably one of the, you know, okay, how do we fit all of this technology and power into just the right size. And one of the very cool things about the size is that uh, we wanted to make sure that, you know, if you wanted to put this in a fairing of a Harley, would it fit, right? And yes, they will fit in that fairing. So if, if uh, we would recommend the ACM2300 in that application to go in and provide a lot of good, clean power. Now, completely different than what a lot of small footprint amplifiers do. These are sound quality, and especially in an open air environment, you will notice uh, the difference in the power and the quality of the output, particularly on motorcycles, side-by-side, -side, stuff like that, when you're comparing some of the less expensive small footprint amplifiers. Yeah. Marginal difference as far as output goes. Yeah. And because we wanted to maybe go into that market, you know, we're, we're diving in with both feet at this point with the ACX amplifiers, but with the ACMs, we did want to make sure that if they did end up on any motorcycles and fairings or anything like that, that they were conformally coded. So all of the ACM amplifiers are all conformally coded boards. Yeah. And so what that really means is that these are not an IP rated amplifier. Okay. These are not waterproof or dust proof in any sense of the word. What it does mean though is that they will handle a, a, a splash or some moisture. They will handle dirt, they'll handle dust, and they'll definitely handle vibration. Vibration is the big one that a lot of companies don't talk about and a lot of shops or installers don't even think about. They just think of, can it get wet? Can it handle dirt? Okay, fine. But what if in the fairing of a Harley, if you've ever ridden a Harley before, those things are a vibration machine, okay? That even at idle, those things are sitting there idling like this with the handlebars moving, right? Um, think of how much vibration there is in that fairing when you're cruising down the highway at 70, 80 miles an hour, right? So a traditional amplifier that's not a conformal coated board, a lot of times will over time literally rattle components loose. You know, you can literally break a component off the PC board just because it's being rattled and vibrated so much. You know, it's enduring a lot, um, especially depending on how it's mounted. So that's one of the things that conformal coating really does well in these amplifiers too for us is, um, you know, although these are not waterproof, like Chris said, 
they will handle a lot of vibration and a lot of kind of harsh environment because they're a conformal coated board. What that basically means is that the PC board is more or less uh, coated in epoxy is the easiest way to kind of think of that. On that, along those same lines, one of the things that I think is uh, important to mention with these, and we talk about this a lot, is five-year warranty. With ACM amplifiers, like everything in the audio control lineup, these have our bulletproof five-year warranty. So regardless of whether this is installed under the seat of a uh, Ford Explorer or in the uh, fairing of a Harley or whatever the case may be, these do have our bulletproof five-year warranty on them, which is awesome. It's just one more thing that you can kind of use um, if you're a, a, a shop owner or a sales guy if, and you're going to talk about these amplifiers and maybe compare them to some other brands out there. Not only do they have awesome sound quality, they actually sound really good, um, but you also have that incredible warranty on there, which is, is huge as far as just knowing that we're going to back you up if anything ever goes wrong. Um, and so that's one of the things that I usually talk about with these two is, you know, are there other amplifiers out there that are going to say that they're more power? Absolutely. There's going to be other amps out there that claim a thousand watts out of a chassis smaller than this. Okay. But the thing to keep in mind, like Chris brought up a little bit ago is quality. If all you're looking for is just dirty power, just pure, raw, filthy, distorted power, then we're not the amp for you, you know? I mean, if you want something that's clean and sounds good and actually has some depth and clarity and some punch to it, then that then you should be looking at these amplifiers. I mean, that's really where things, we kind of draw the line in the sand in my mind is we're honest about the power ratings, we have an awesome warranty to back it up. And, you know, not only will they hold up to the environment, but they actually sound good. I mean, why do we do these audio upgrades in the first place, you guys? We do these upgrades because we want it to sound better right? If all they're looking for is just louder, well, there's a lot of ways to make something louder. That doesn't necessarily make it better, right? So that's one of those things that I always like to bring up with these two is that, again, we didn't just come out with these because we wanted to make a small amp um, because everybody else is making small amps. We came out with these because we wanted to make one that actually sounds good. Um, if you are a, a shop and you sell and install small chassis amplifiers, um, chances are you've come across some that really don't sound very good because let me tell you, there's a lot of them out there that really don't sound very good. Um, and these are not one of them. These actually have a really nice uh, sound quality to them. So I'm gonna put up another poll real quick while we're kind of talking about this stuff. And I wanna see how many of you guys have actually um, used the ACM amps in the past. Um, how many of you have any experience with them? So uh, take a minute and uh, vote in the poll there for me if you would. And uh, while you guys are voting, we'll just talk about a couple of different things here as far as applications and that sort of thing. So Chris brought up motorcycles a minute ago. Um, that's a great use for these. I've actually visited a handful of shops that the 2.300 is kind of their go-to for simple Harley systems. Um, it's a great way to go for those guys that just have a street glide that came with two speakers in the front fairing. And all they really want to do is just have more volume at higher mile per hour speeds that they can still hear and have good clarity and less distortion. 2.300 is a great way to accomplish that. Um, and physically it fits nicely up there in the fairing. Uh, we also have a lot of guys using a 2.300 for add, add a speaker kits when they already have two speakers in the fairing, but they're adding a couple to those back bags. The 2.300s are great for that. Uh, any vehicle where space is tight, you know, I mean, these don't have to be for uh, smart cars and, you know, Scion IQs and all these little micro cars, Mini Coopers and that sort of thing. They're great for all cars. You know, I mean, just because you have a F-350 doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of space to work with, right? As we all know, these newer vehicles are coming with less and less space to actually fit aftermarket components in them. These are a great solution to that. Um, inside dashboards, I used to do Dodge Ram trucks fairly regularly. Uh, I always mention this in my trainings because it's one of my favorite ones to do, but a lot of the new Rams that have the big Uconnect screen in the dash, it's a big Uconnect screen, climate controls right below it. That whole panel pops off and there is a cavern of space inside that dashboard. You can easily fit a couple of these in that dash. Um, and then all your wire runs are super short and everything's hidden. We actually had a dealer on Facebook recently show us that the new Jeep Renegade has like a shelf in the dash behind the radio where an LC2i fits beautifully. I'm sure you could fit an ACM with a little bit of work in there. So think of those kind of weird, cool applications where you could do some neat stuff with them. Um, you know, again, anybody building their system in stages, I think that's an important one because I, I think a lot of customers come in and, and want to do things in stages, but we end up putting them into 
something that fit their budget but didn't necessarily fit a long-term plan. You know, you sold them a couple hundred dollar amplifier for now because it's what they could afford, but it doesn't really set them up for success in the future as far as being able to upgrade and add on and that sort of thing. If we were to put them into something that was good quality and actually sounded good, and then we could build off of it, well, then we don't have to replace it again in six months or whenever they come back in. And then the other use that I think doesn't get brought up a lot, but is a great use for these amplifiers, is when you just need to add some channels. You know, maybe you have a um, one of our six channel amps, maybe you have the LC 6.1200 or the D 6.1200. Well, those have a set of RCA outputs on them, right? And maybe you are doing more than just six channels of amplified audio. A really popular combo is to do the LC or D 6.1200 to run active three-way components in the front of a vehicle. So six, three, tweet, and then do a ACM 2.300 off of those RCA outputs to run the rear doors coaxes or a 4.300 to run the rear door components or whatever the case may be. So it's great when you just need to add a couple of channels. Maybe you're even doing a big active system with DSP and you just need something small that can run that factory center channel or those uh, D pillar little three and a half speakers that are back there or something like that. An ACM 4.300 is a quick, easy add-on. If we just need to amplify a couple extra channels, it's a great way to just add some channels to that system. Uh, good way to do it. So in the polls here, uh, I'll end the poll real quick and I can share that with you guys. So a couple of you had said yes and they were impressed. And the majority of you say, no, but I would like to. So um, that's good to know. I appreciate you guys being honest in the polls and stuff too. And, and it's one of those things where um, I think I've told numerous uh, uh, shops and, and guys that I talk to that, hey, next time you place an order with audio control, put at least one ACM amplifier on your order and just try it. You know, I mean, it can't hurt to get in one and give it a shot. Um, I, I have never had anybody order one and call me and say, Matt, I hate this thing. Why did I order this? Blah, blah, blah. They always end up being happy that they did. So I know a few shops that have actually switched to these as their uh, primary amplifier for doing basic uh, base packages. Um, and I can't stress how valuable they are for when that customer comes in and it's like 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon and everybody wants to go home on time. Uh, they're great for doing a quick base package. Run power, run ground tap a speaker in the car for some signal and away you go. You've just done a base package, right? I mean, they, they couldn't be easier for that stuff, so. Yeah, Mike, Mike put up there, um, I've heard his Kia, but he has a, he uses an ACM and he uses just three channels of it, um, one for center and, uh, and the other two for rear fill. So yeah, if you're looking for a lot of big power, you can use the LC amplifiers to do yeah. like an active two-way if you're doing a four channel or use the six channel. Um, the, these amplifiers though, I mean, I'm still um, looking forward to doing some bigger builds with these. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've wanted to, since day one, um, do a, a personal build and that's probably what I'll be working on, but use an else, uh, the ACM 1300, uh, use two of those just for my front mids and then use the uh, ACM 4300 for, um, for my mid mid and uh, tweeter yeah. uh, combo, and I think that would just be a killer killer kick ass front cool. stage. It'd be very cool. Yep. Well, and there's uh, let's see, uh, Market Car Audio Fab's been working on that that one car with some oh, ACMs yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. He's shown some pictures of that build on Facebook, and I'm really excited to hear that car in person. I was looking forward to that one at Knowledge Fest, but obviously with what's going on, we didn't get to do that. So hopefully we'll have that car in our booth at a future Knowledge Fest. And I'm excited to have that one. I love small cars uh, with simple systems. 2.1, you know, two speakers or a pair of components and a sub can be incredible when it's set up right and, and, and powered well with some, some clean power like this. So I think that'll be a, a pretty cool um, car once that gets, you know, exposed to the world and everybody gets to hear it. So it yep. um, should be pretty slick. So I'm gonna uh, throw one more poll up there at you guys while we're uh, uh, kind of wrapping things up here. So um, as far as features that are important to you, um, you know, what's important is, you know, uh, is having Bluetooth built in something that's important? Do you mind adding that Bluetooth module yourself? Do you like having the idea of maybe something with uh, DSP built in? Would you rather keep that separate to try to keep costs down? So vote for me on the poll that I just put up. Tell me what's important to you as far as these small chassis amplifiers 
go. I know, I mean, obviously price is always important, right? I mean, it's one of those things that's always taken into consideration, but what's most important is what I'm trying to ask you. So uh, please vote for me on that. And, and uh, I see a lot of you so far voting that sound quality is the most important feature. That's really good to hear. I love hearing that because unfortunately, we see in, in this 12 volt car audio world these days, there's a lot of um, manufacturers out there where sound quality is not important. It's sometimes not even a consideration right. for some of these guys. It's just about power and price. And, uh, you know, hey, to each their own, it's just not us. So I just like to know, you know, what's important to you guys on this. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to vote in there. While you guys are doing that, there is a question. Is the ACR1 open exposed like the ACR3? So I, I would talk re real quick about the differences between the ACR1, the ACR2, and the ACR3. ACR1s uh, are, are have a pot. So they have a, a start and a stop, all right? The ACR um, two and three are encoders, all right? So those are continuously rotating um, controllers, all right? And those are programmed for, for here for what they're gonna do. Um, and that's why with the ACR three, you can use those with your DSP and stuff like that to send different messages. So um, they are open, I would say, Probably about 60% of the time, guys will open them up and then panel mount them. I was going to say, if by open, you mean that the back of them is open like they used to be? Because I, I know if you're talking about how they used to be in previous generations, they were basically an L bracket with some goodies mounted behind it. And if you flipped it around, you could see the guts of the knob and all that stuff. They are no longer like that. They are a closed little metal box. Um, but to Chris's point, if you mean that you can open them up and mount them, they are very mountable. We have purposely made the knob um, robust and metal and really nice if you are gonna keep it all enclosed, but if you are gonna panel mount it and do a custom mount, which is obviously a nice looking way to do it, these come apart really nicely. The LED even can be unplugged and plugged in. I mean, it's, it's, it's like we made them with the idea of you flush mounting them, imagine that, so. Yeah, and, and just, just so you guys all out there know, uh, three years ago, those were completely redesigned. So the, all three of them, the ACR 1, 2, and 3, were all redesigned three years ago. They're about 35% smaller yeah. than the old ones. Much smaller, um, much cleaner, nicer and, looking. And much easier. So, yeah. you know, it, um, these these have been way, way nicer in the last three yes. years. That was, that was one of the things like... Uh, you know, if you go back five years ago, guys would actually complain quite a bit about ACRs. And I think in the last three years, that hasn't come up at all, yeah. really. Yeah. So um, yeah. really nice, newly engineered ACRs uh, for all three of those models. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, from an installer's perspective, like one of the things that used to drive me crazy as a tech was trying to mount some of the base knobs that, that manufacturers would, would supply with their amplifiers and things it used to drive me crazy because they'd give you this tiny little metal strip and two little micro screws. And you had to mount it, try to slide the thing on there or whatever. These are really well designed. I mean, they've got four mounting holes. So if you can't get to the front two, you can get to the back two or vice versa. I mean, it, if it's got to go you know, under a dash and it's going to go on a certain point of the dash, there's enough mounting tabs to always catch some material. Like uh, we were talking about taking it apart and, and flush mounting it. Um, on the package itself, it actually shows you how to take it apart. It shows you how to, you know, disassemble it easily for flush mounting. What's cool is it's in this nice little, you know, metal housing and everything, but there's actually just two little screws on the bottom that slide out and this whole thing literally comes apart. Um, it's pretty easy to, to disassemble. And we even went so far as like the, um, the actual threaded shaft of the uh, knob itself actually has threads long enough on it. You know how when you're trying to mount these sometimes in a panel, the threads don't go far enough and you can't get the nut on there to, to cinch it down? We actually made sure that the threads on this metal shaft go far enough to where you can actually drill your hole, back mount this from the backside, tighten down that nut, and it looks clean, it looks professional every time. So um, a lot of thought went into something that is seemingly very simple, uh, but makes a big difference as far as everyday life of the installer, trying to make life easy. You know, ask any tech, uh, walk into a shop and ask any tech, 
hey, which base knob do you hate putting in? They're gonna have an answer for you on whose knob they always hate putting in because the threads aren't long enough or it's tough to custom mount or whatever the case may be. And these are just really, really easy and well designed, so. And I think one of the other things with the, the audio control product is, is, you know, a lot of manufacturers can just kind of get a, a, a pot in a plastic housing and just yeah. kind of throw it in with one of their sub amplifiers. We don't include uh, the ACRs with any of those mono amplifiers, but uh, when you do get the ACR, you will notice it is, you know, in a very nice metal housing. You know, I think even paying attention to how we engineer even the ACRs all in house is a testament to the quality that we're trying to put out at audio control, making sure that, um, you know, every single one of our products, including ACRs, uh, are going to be backed up by that five-year warranty that Matthew yep. talked about. So, yep. So let's see here, just kind of scrolling through things, seeing if there's anything else uh, questions-wise. I think we pretty much covered everything, unless you had anything else uh, questions-wise, Chris. No. Nope. Anything on Facebook or anything like that? Uh, hi, guys. Do the ACMs have clipping indicator on the inputs and outputs? These have a maximized light built into them. And so the maximized light is going to talk about the output side of the uh, ACMs. Yep. So the uh, um, so that's going to help you to basically set it up. It does not have a input clipping indicator though to answer your question more directly. Yep. Well, guys, um, I'll let Matthew wrap it up. But before he does, um, thanks again for being here. Um, we are super excited about uh, what what's been accomplished um, having you guys with us for our tenth. Um, go around here at the at the factory. Um, we are busy, busy trying to keep up with uh, with the demand on on our products across the board, and um, we can't thank you guys enough. Uh, for those of you guys who have access or know uh, how to get a hold of us, we are here, ready for you, available. Our tech support lines um, uh, are busy right now, busier than they've probably ever been. Um, but we are available for any questions. That number is 425-775-8461. And uh, we want to be here to uh, make sure that you continue and we all continue to make good sound great. <laughs> there you go. There's my little uh, last minute jab at uh, trying to sell something. <laughs> oh, by the way, did you know we have a five-year warranty and all of our stuff sounds incredibly awesome? <laughs> Well said, Chris. Well said. Well, thank you guys for joining us.